This is lesson 2.1, properties of radical functions. In this lesson, we'll take a look at how to graph and analyze radical functions. A radical function has the form y is equal to the square root of f of x, where f of x is a function. Since we know that the square root of a number is only defined for values greater than or equal to zero, meaning that we can't have negative values inside of here, we know that the domain must be greater than or equal to zero. Well, because this value right in here must be greater than or equal to zero, meaning we can't take the square root of negatives, we know that the value that we get out must also be greater than or equal to zero. What I want you to um, recall is that if we take a look at a quadratic function, like we dealt with last unit, y is equal to the square root of x, if I asked you to graph that, we would start at the origin, 0, 0, and then we'd do our step pattern. We would go over 1, up 1, because 1 squared is 1. If we put a value in for 2, 2 squared is 4, and 3 and 9, and so on. Well, the same is true for radical functions, only there's one slight difference. Let's take a look. If you put in 0, the square root of 0 is 0. If you put in 1, the square root of 1 is 1. So those two points, notice, are exactly the same. But that's where things start to change. If you were to put in 2, the square root of 2 is definitely not 4. It's somewhere right in here. So that's kind of a tough point to use. So instead, what we're going to use is we're going to use those perfect square points. If we were to go to 1, 2, 3, 4 and put in 4, we know for sure that the square root of 4 is exactly 2. The other one that we know on, uh, the least that would fit on this graph, is 9. So if we count over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, we know that the square root of 9 is 3. So keep in mind those same numbers. You'll notice that this makes kind of like half a quadratic right there. Those numbers are going to be very beneficial when we go to uh, graph these radical functions. All right, let's move on to um, taking a look at how radical graphs are related to linear graphs. So if we take a look at this function, y is equal to the square root of x plus 3 right here, we can see, of course, that this is a radical function. And the function that we have right next to it is very similar, of course. We just haven't taken the square root of it. It's a linear function. So what I want uh, us to take a look at is how are these functions related? What can we say about one in compared to the other? Let's start with our linear function, something we're a little bit more familiar with. Notice that this is in y equals mx plus b, where the one in front of the x is our slope, rise over run, and we have our y-intercept at 3. So let's go and graph that. I'll graph it in pink right here. We have a y-intercept at 1, 2, and 3, and then we have our slope. Our slope is up 1 over 1, like so. So rise over run, we get a lovely graph like so. Now using our straight edge, we have something that looks like the following. Now that we have our linear graph, let's see how the radical graph is related. Well, this one I'll do in green. If we take a look, what value of x could I put in here such that when I take the square root of it, I get 0? So essentially, I'm trying to make this part underneath the radical 0. Well, if you take a look, if I took negative 3 and put it in, negative 3 plus 3 is 0, the square root is 0. So this point right here at negative 3 will be at 0. Notice that that's a common point between the two graphs. Well, that's kind of interesting. Well, what can we also see? Let's keep moving in the negative direction. What happens if we put negative 4 in? Negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1, but we can't take the square root of negative 1. So that means we won't have any points going to the left of the one that we have right there. Let's try points to the right. If we put in negative 2, negative 2 plus 3 is 1, and the square root of 1 is 1. So those are both common points right there. What about if we put in this point right here, the x value of negative 1? Negative 1 plus 3 is 2. The square root of 2 is going to be somewhere right in here, but it's a tough point for us to figure out. So if we take our original point right here, and then we go 1, 2, 3, 4 over, watch what will happen. Well, that's a point that in the graph before turned out to be pretty useful. Well, if we put in this value at 1, 1 plus 3 is 4, and we know that the square root of 4 is 2. So you'll see that our regular radical graph that we had before, that was right here at 0, 0, 1, 1, 4, 2, and 3, 9, has just been shifted over a little bit. Well, if we count over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, the square root of 9 is 3. And if you take a look, if we were to put in this value, which is at 6 right here, 6 plus 3 is 9, of course, and the square root of 9 gives me that point at 3. So we have a graph that looks something like so. So what can we say about that? Well, we notice that we have these two points right here. These are known as common points. We'll actually call them something different in a second. So those two common points, we have the ordered pair at negative 3 and 0. And we have the ordered pair at negative 2 and 1. And we call them common, of course, because they lie on both graphs. Let's talk about the domain and range for our radical function. Well, the domain. 
we take a look at what x values we have right here, we have x values that are from negative 3 and are going positive. So we say that x must be greater than or equal to negative 3. What about the range? Well, of course, we only have positive values because we can't take the square root of negatives. So we'd say that y must be greater than or equal to 0. You'll, say that, you'll see that that'll happen um, very often. Not all the time, but, uh, but pretty often. Okay. Let's go and look at the other graphs that we have up here. Again, we have our radical function and we have our linear function here in pink. We'll graph the linear function first. Notice that this time we have a negative slope and we have a y-intercept at 1. So my slope is going to go, instead of rising 1, it's going to fall 1 and run 1, like so. So notice that I'm doing my linear function. It's going all the way to the edge of my graph. I will take my straight edge and we have something that looks like the following. Now, Let's attack the radical graph and see what happens. Well, for this one over here, recall that we had those common points at uh, whenever the y value was at 0 and 1. Let's see if that's the case here. Well, if I was to put in this value right here, this looks like 1 for x. Let's see what happens. I'd have negative 1 plus 1 is 0. Well, the square root of 0 is 0, so that must be a point like so. And again, whenever it was below here, it didn't seem to work, but let's just check it again. If we put in an x value of 2, We'd have negative 2 plus 1 is the square root of negative 1, and of course we can't do that. So we know that the points are going to go in the negative direction from here, or the, in the direction to the left. If we put in a x value of 0, negative 0 is just 0, 0 plus 1 is 1. So we get those two common points again. And then from there what you'll see is that the same thing's going to happen. If we just count from this point 1, 2, 3, 4, the square root of that point is going to be 2. So just to prove it to you, if we put in a negative 3 here, a negative negative 3 is 3, 3 plus 1 is 4, the square root of 4 gives me that point which is at 2. If we count over 9 from the original point right here, we'd have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and that would be equivalent to 3. So we have a graph that looks something like so. Okay, so again, we have those two common points. Where are they specifically located? Well, let's write that down. We have common points at 1, 0, so that would be this one right here, and we have it at 0, 1. So those points lie um, on both graphs. Okay, Let's take a look at the domain and range. Well, what can we say about that? The domain, this time, notice that they're not greater than or equal to. We'd say that x is less than or equal to. It looks like the biggest value we had in x was at 1, so x is less than or equal to 1. And the range, again, is y is greater than or equal to 0. We don't have any negative values. The last thing I wanted to just say on uh, this page right here is that um, we call these th common points. So common points just means that it's on both graphs. And uh, for the rest of this lesson, um, we're going to refer to them. Common points are known as a little bit more mathematical term, we call them invariant points, just meaning that they appear on both of the graphs. Okay, So when I, you hear me say invariant points, I'm really just referencing the common points that we uh, attacked before. Let's go and take a look at a couple examples. Example 1 says, for the linear graphs below, sketch the graph of the radical function and state the domain and range. So what we're going to take a look at right here is you've probably started to see a little bit of a pattern. Whenever our original graph, so our linear function, is at a uh, y value of 0, we have a invariant point. So I'm going to draw a common point there and right there. Now you'll notice that they also gave us these other points right here and right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a little table of values and um, just to show what is happening there. So we have our x value I'm going to write, and then we're going to have y is equal to f of x. And then we're going to have y is equal to the square root of f of x. So my x value is my input. The y is equal to f of x. That is the output for my linear function. And the y is equal to the square root of f of x. That's the output for my radical function. So if we go and we substitute in an x value of 0, like they've given us right here, we get a y value of 4. And we, of course, know that the square root of 4 is 2. So we can put that point right there. Right. Now, they've given us another kind of mysterious one up here. When x is equal to 2, it looks like we get a value of 8. Now, this is why I wanted to write this table down here, because 8 is not a perfect square value. It's not that easy for us to deal with. So I'll just write the square root of 8, and then what you'd have to do is you'd have to go and put this into your calculator, and you'd find that the square root of 8 is going to be just less than uh, 3, of course. It's at 2.8. So I'm going to go and I'm going to plot this point just south of 3 right here, and we have our radical graph that would look something like so. Okay, notice that I have it going to the edge of my uh, page right there. Well, let's talk about the domain and range. The domain and the range of this. 
What values of x do we have? Well, we have values of x from negative 2 going in the positive direction, so x must be greater than or equal to negative 2. And again, for the range, we have only positive values. Okay. Let's go do the same thing for this other graph over here. Uh, again, I'll draw my table out. And once I finish uh, with my table, I will go and find my uh, invariant points to start. So we have the following, like so. Okay. So my invariant points, wherever it's at a value of 0 in the y, so right there, and a value of 1 right here, those will be common points, my invariant points. And then you'll notice that they gave us these other two points right here. So I'm going to use these to help me. Looks like when you have an x value of 0, you have a y input on our linear function of 3. And when you have an x value of 2, you have an output of 2. Well, let's take a look at what this square root of 3 is. Again, these points aren't going to be quite as nice. The square root of 3 is equal to approximately 1.7. And the square root of 2 is equal to 1.4. And so this is just how you can kind of graph these by hand like this. You're not needing to use technology at all. So uh, x value of 2 gives me 1.4. So 1.4 would be approximately maybe right here. And 1.7 would be right about here. So this function for my radical function would look like so. Okay, again, notice how it goes to the edge of the page. All right. Uh, finally, let's attack my domain and range. The domain, what x values do I have? Well, it looks like I have values from x going um, uh, from 6 in the negative direction, so x must be less than or equal to 6. And the range, it looks like I have values that start right here at 0, and they are going up. So we have y is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. So that was dealing with a linear function. Let's go and look at example 2. Notice here that we have a quadratic function. Well, um, what is the radical function going to look like for a quadratic function? Again, we're going to try to state the domain and range. So first, let's start by identifying what the um, invariant points are. Wherever the original graph is at 0 and 1, we uh, have those invariant points. Okay? And in addition, you'll notice that we have these two other points that they've given us. So let's put that into our table once again. We have x, our input. We have our output for our original um, function, our quadratic function. And then we have the output for our radical function. So that looks like we have one at 0 right here and one at, what's that, 6. So when we put 0 in, the output value for the quadratic function is at 5. And this other one is also at 5. So those values should be the same when we take the square root of them. And if we take the square root of 5 for both of these, they'll, of course, be equal to the same thing, which is 2.2. So we can say that when you put in an input value of 6, the radical, the square root of that is going to give you 2.2, which would be approximately here and approximately here. So if you had to take a look at what this graph looks like, it's going to move something like so and something like so. Okay, ballpark figure like that. All right, so that's the sketch. We also need to do the domain and range. So domain and range. This one's a little bit more interesting. You'll notice that we have what looks like a hole right here. Well, how come we didn't do anything with that hole? Well, as you can see, if we were to take this value, for instance, um, at negative 4 right there, well, what's the square root of negative 4? Well, you can't take the square root of that, so that's why there is no values in between here for the radical function. So we have two separate parts right here. If we talk about this part right here, it looks like we have values at um, 5 going in the positive direction. So x must be greater than or equal to 5. And then on the other part right here, we have values that are uh, less than or equal to 1. My range values, we don't have any negative values. We just have values, once again, that are greater than or equal to 0. Okay, Let's move on and take a look at the next question over here. So we have a, um, a quadratic function. I like to say that this quadratic function is unhappy. So let's take a look at what the radical function looks like for it. Uh, highlight uh, to start your invariant points, wherever it's at 0 and 1. So those will be common points, again. Uh, I'll start with my table. I have my input x. I have my output of my uh, original function, my quadratic function, and the output of my radical function is right here. Okay. So the values that they've given us, this time they've given us three. Looks like we have at negative 2, at 0, and at 2. So negative 2, 0, and 2. Let's see what happens. If we put in negative 2 right here, and uh, the output that we get is at 5. And of course, that one's also at 5, so put that down there. And it looks like 0 right here, we have 9. Well, 9's going to work out pretty nice. Maybe I'll just do this one right away, because the square root of 9 is given to give us 3. We already dealt with root 5 on the last question. That gave me 2.2 .2 and 2.2. .2. 
So let's go and plot those points and see what our radical function looks like for this. And you're going to see it's kind of funky. So the input value was negative 2, and that gave us an output of 2.2. So I'll put that approximately here and approximately here. And then the square root of 9 was at 3. So we have that point is definitely right there. So we get a function that looks something like this and like this. You notice that it makes kind of a semicircle. Well, the domain and range for this turns out to be a little bit more complicated than what we're used to. So the domain, what values of x do we have? Well, we only have x from 3 to negative 3. So in mathematics, you might recall, in order to say between, you put the big number, which in this case is going to be 3. On the right-hand side, we say x has to be less than or equal to that point, and it has to be greater than or equal to this point at negative 3. Let's talk about our range. Well, the range, again, we're in one of these between situations. So we'll use y. We'll put our big number, which in this case is 3, and our small number, which is 0 right there. So again, that's his between in mathematics. Okay. So that's our domain and range in dealing with um, the radical function of a quadratic function right there. So again, we've dealt with a linear. We've dealt with quadratic. Let's kick it up a notch. And in example 3, you'll see that we have a cubic function. Again, we're going to take a look at finding the domain and range and our original graph. So let's highlight where our invariant points are, those common points. Wherever the graph is at 0, so right here and right here, those will be common points. And right here, whoops, right here, this point is at 1. So that'll be a common point. Um, notice this graph is a little bit funky in the sense that it's going over by 0.5s. So again, it's going up by 0.5s right there, so that's why that point is common. Okay. So um, we also have these points right here. Let's make a table just so we can be clear of uh, what we end up getting for these. So x was my input. This is my output for my cubic function. And this is going to be the output for the square root of my cubic function. Okay. So the x values that we have right here, notice that they've given us this point. This point is at negative 0.5, and the output that we end up getting is 0.125. When we take the square root of 0 0.125, you'll need to use your calculator for that, and that gives us 0.4. Um, the last thing we need to attack is this last point that we have right here, and so that is an input value of 1, and that gives us an output value of 2, which will be the square root of 2 right here, which the square root of 2 gives us approximately 1.4. Okay, so let's go and graph these points. Uh, this one right here is at 0.4, so that's going to be just below uh, what was uh, right here at 0.5, so that'll be a point. And then we have this one at 1.4, so 1 is right there, this is 1.5, so we'll have something like that. Okay. So if we took a look at our graph right here, maybe I'll just do it in pink just so that it's uh, a little bit easier to see. Um, but what we have right here is it's going to start at this point right here, it's going to go and hit that point, and that's going to come back down and hit this point, and then it's heading back upwards. It'll go through this point like here, right here, and continue off our graph. Okay. Uh, lastly, domain range. So what values of x do we have? It looks like we have values of x from negative 1 going in the positive direction, so x is greater than or equal to negative 1. And range, again, we don't have anything below this x-axis, so we'd say that y has to be greater than or equal to 0. All right, so to conclude this lesson, uh, there's two big things that we really focused on when you're trying to graph these radical functions. You first need to find those invariant points, those points that are common between the two graphs. And then what you need to do is use any additional points that are given, take the square root of those points, and then graph it like so. All right, that concludes this lesson.